know, they, they get their work done. And let me tell you, on Wednesday nights and Sunday afternoons, if you ever watch the practice, you'd feel like you're on the outside looking in of a of a constant inside joke where they, they're just all laughing and, and having fun and, and praying for each other. It's a blessing. And thank you, uh, Myra, for leading that. It's a blessing to us as a church. It really is. And uh, we look forward to being whole again in our uh, in, in our sanctuary. But we know where we worship doesn't matter as much as who we worship and how we worship. And today I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. And we're talking and we're in the middle of a kind of a bigger series uh, at, with some smaller topics in between of the values of our church. And maybe you got a hold of our um, uh, newsletter uh, in the mail this past week or so. And, and if you read the article that I wrote in there, I'm not a writer. I'm, I, I'm a much better speaker than I am a writer. So if you imagine my voice when you read it, it sounds better. All right? um, and you don't, you don't look at misspellings as much uh, and grammar. That, but now, here's the deal. Uh, when we look at uh, what God's called us to be as a church, uh, we are bound and driven and led by values. Uh, not just as a church organization, but also as people. Like, uh, one of the best things we can do for our children is to teach them values, right? Uh, raise them up in the way they should go. That idea is not just the way they should go as in mapping out your child's every step for their entire life. It's not micromanagement parenting. It's not hover parenting. It's literally saying, hey, when we do something, we do it this way. And therefore, when they live and move and go, and wherever they live, wherever they go, you've instilled in them values, whether you wanted to or not, you've instilled in them values, uh, and they will live those out. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, they're, they're telling you all across the uh, TV these days, if you're not watching a, a Mike Bloomberg political commercial, you may be watching a different commercial, one that reminds you of how much like your parent you're becoming. Uh, there's a commercial out there uh, when you buy a house and all of a sudden you start looking like your parents and, and acting like your parents. And uh, here you have a 20-something-year-old guy who bought a house and says, who left that door open? Were you raised in a barn? And a uh, you know, lady walks by the thermostat and is like, oh, touch that thermostat. And it's just a real characterization of, of what it looks like to become more and more like your parents. But the reality is when we are to instill values into someone or something, we're hoping that those will guide them. Right? Like we are raising them with values. And the same thing goes for church. We have a Heavenly Father who's given us values that as His children, as a church, that we are to be striving towards with these values. The mission is simple. is to make disciples of every nation, tribe and tongue. To take the gospel of Jesus from here to there and everywhere in between. Right? That's our, that's our mission. That's what we've been called to do. How we do it is by loving God, loving people, and reaching the world. Now, as we go along, it's real simple. God has called us first and foremost to have a relationship with Him. The one big way we do that is we pray. It fosters a greater relationship with Him when we pray. And so we, we said one of our values as a church was to be that we Pray. We pray as often and as passionately as we can. That's what we do. How often do we pray? As often as possible. Whenever we can, as whenever we think about it, we want to be praying. How, do, how should we pray? As passionately and as committed as we should be to anything else in this life, we should be committed to prayer. Prayer is like breathing for Christians. Uh, the second thing we value is relationships. We talked about that the past couple of weeks. We uh, we know that God builds His kingdom on the rails of relationships. And what that means is God uses your relationships and my relationships to build and build up the church. He's going to build the church through evangelism, and He's going to build up the church through our relationships. It happens, who do you know that does not know the Lord? Who do you know that needs the hope of Jesus? <coughs> What church member do you know and have a relationship that needs to learn how to pray? God has called us to build and build up the church through relationships. And then today, what we talked about last week, is we do that through serving. That we are to be committed to a lifestyle 
of serving. Now, whether you're a leader or uh, a servant, those two things aren't different. That even as you lead, the Bible tells us, the verse we looked at last week says, even though the Gentiles, they lord it over you, not should it be so amongst you, but rather you should take on the form of a servant. And we gave out towels. How many of y'all have your towels today? You bring it? Some of y'all have. I like that. And some, somebody comes, I feel bad. I didn't bring my towel. That's okay. There's no judgment here. But here's what we've got. Now, if you didn't get a towel, we have some more towels over here. Uh, they're right over here. Uh, they're going to be on this uh, the communion table right over here. Grab your towel on the way out. There's nothing special about the towels. These aren't the kind of towels that you pay $9.95 to somebody and they send you a prayer towel. This isn't that, okay? This is a 99, I think it's like a 47 cent towel uh, washcloth or wash rag, depends on what part of the country you're from, and, and these are just from Walmart. But what it can do for us is it can remind us that towels are more important than titles. That how we serve and the fact that we're serving is more important than our titles. Now what kind of titles are we talking about? Well, I'm a Christian. Nobody cares if you're a Christian if you ain't serving. Uh, the old saying goes, they don't care how much you know until you know they know how much you care. Well, I'm a Christian. Well, no one cares if you're a Christian if you ain't serving. As a matter of fact, a Christian who claims to be a Christian and doesn't pick up a towel and serves mankind and their fellow brother, they're just putting a bad name on them. Well, I'm a pastor. No one cares if Brad's a pastor or not, if he's not serving. Well, I'm a deacon. No one cares. Unless you're serving. I've been at this church for 75. No one cares. <laughs> Towels are more important than titles. What kind of titles? All different kinds of titles we have. But what's important is that we find ourselves as believers serving. Now, so let's look a little bit more about how God's designed that to work. So it's 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. And we're going to look at this letter that Peter wrote. Peter uh, was, has the name, uh, basically his name was changed from Cephas to Peter. Uh, it means little rock. It means uh, not like Arkansas, but like little rock, or not little rock and roll. Just It was talking about like pebbles. Uh, see, Peter had a big grandiose view of himself when he was early on in his discipleship process. He thought he was the stuff. As a matter of fact, um, that verse in Matthew uh, that tells us that Jesus will build his church, that was in response to Peter thinking he was somebody. And he was like, listen, it's not about you, Peter. It's about Jesus building his church. Now, did God use Peter? Absolutely. Uh, Peter thought he was swift, too. I mean, he, they came up, and guess what? He's going to take out a sword. Uh, he's probably concealed carrying that sword, you know, and he probably whipped it out and chopped the dude's ear off. Think he was aiming for his ear? No. Nope. Probably trying to chop his head off. I mean, you don't swing a sword someone's ear. All right? Usually, they, he was going in uh, for the kill, and Jesus stopped him and healed the man and sent him away. And Right? And in this moment, Peter says, hey, I'm going to be there with you, Jesus, no matter what happens. And what did Jesus tell him? You're going to deny me how many times? Three times. And at the third time, guess what's going to happen? Rooster's going to crow. Let me hear your best rooster. You got a good rooster? Some of y'all wish y'all could have shown off a little bit more right there. You, you probably got a good rooster that you're holding back. You don't want to let it all out right now. But like, if you want to show me your rooster crow later, I'd be in on it. Now, and he did fall. He failed Jesus. He, he left. Um, and, and, and the way it happened was ironic that not only did he leave, and he was there when Jesus was being held in trial in the middle of the night in this kangaroo court that was thrown together to push Jesus to the cross and, and take him out of the political scene that was happening. Um, little did they know that wasn't his desire to be there. It's his desire to be in the spiritual scene of people's lives. They were worried about him taking over politically and he was trying to change people's hearts. And in this moment, he, 
uh, Peter comes in and, and, and he's standing by the fire warming his hands and this little kid who was probably way up past their bedtime looks at him and says, wait a minute, aren't you one of those disciples? Yeah, I've seen you with him. And that's when he denied him. So you have a man who's been, uh, who was very pompous in what he thought of himself and was taken 